Welcome everyone to this uh, fourth climate seminar series dedicated to climate change mitigation and adaptation. We're very happy to be back for our fourth series for the academic year 2023-2024. Uh, I'm Charmilino. For those who don't know me, I'm project manager at Climate, and I'm going to be the moderator of today's seminar. As you can see on the slide, I'm sharing uh, the, the agenda of today's seminar is very uh, easy. We're going to Ha we have an amazing uh, guest speaker with us, Elise Buckle. She's going to present the 2023 Agenda for Climate, People, and Nature Then for about 30 minutes. And then we're going to have a discussion with all the participants. And then we're going to end the seminar around 1 and 1.15. Um, just a few indications regarding the Q&A and the presentation in general. The presentation, uh, today's presentation is going to be in English. But for future seminars, so you can know it's, it can be either in French or in English, and the Q&A is open in both languages. Feel free to raise your hand, uh, your digital hand, or to write your questions in the chat. And then we're going to speak all together during the, the discussion with all participants. I'm going to present briefly Elise, our guest of honor today. Elise Buckle is a globally recognized expert who has been working in the field of climate and sustainability for over 20 years. She is co-founder of She Changes Climate, CEO of Climate and Sustainability, and board member of the Climate Action Accelerator, as well as the International Sustainability Standards Board Sustainability Council. She is an international gender champion since early 2023. Elise has a strong track record of building successful global alliances to deliver positive impacts for climate, people, and nature. Elise, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Charmi, and welcome, everybody. Uh, very nice to be connected after a very intense weekend. I'm sure that many of you were at the Climate March in Bern. I was there with uh, my dear friend, uh, Julia Steinberger, Steinberger, I see that she's here, and I know there were many scientists, teachers, and students on the street. I must say it was really uh, heartwarming to see many people together for climate justice. I think we were 60,000 people on the street, which was the largest gathering since COVID-19. Um, obviously, this is not enough. We all know that the climate emergency is happening right now. Uh, we might get beyond the 1.5 degree threshold this year. I think Julia was telling me, according to the IPCC, there's a 50% chance that we might go beyond 1.5 degree already this year. And this is having impacts on millions of people around the world. I'm sure you've seen the images of uh, droughts and floods and also the El Nino effect uh, is uh, accelerating this, um, this impact. So we must really also work on uh, convincing our decision makers that we need to step up in terms of climate ambition, in terms of implementation of the legislation. So something we want to do this week actually is to write to all the candidates that are going to run for elections during the federal elections on the 22nd of October and really urge them to accelerate the implementation of the climate legislation. As you know, we all voted yes for this climate law. And now there's been some powerful uh, lobbying, I think from, uh, again, coming from the same side, you know, the, the fossil fuel industry, but also the chemical industry to try to delay the implementation to 2025 here in Switzerland. And so we can't let that happen. And we will write to uh, the top of the list, all the candidates that have a good chance of being elected or reelected to really urge them to accelerate the implementation of this legislation as, as soon as possible and at the very start of the legislation. Uh, it's not, we know this law is not enough, so let's, let's not delay that until uh, 2025. So anyway, this is just a quick intro. I thought it would be good to be in sync with uh, what's happening here in Switzerland and all the energy. I'd, like, I'd love to know here if you can put your camera on. And if you can say if you were in Bern on, on Saturday, just to have an idea of who was there. I also felt happy and energized because I see that with the time, we are getting more and more people on the street to support this cause. 
But at the same time, I was really asking myself, what is it that we can do differently? And uh, one of the things we do at She Changes Climate is we build bridges between the scientists, the decision makers, and the grassroots mobilization. And we feel that if we are better at this, what I call the double squeeze, uh, the top-down policy and advocacy work, so influencing people at the heart of the decision-making in the Swiss government, at the COP28 uh, negotiations, even at the heart of the COP28 presidency, that's also somewhere we need to really make some change. And at the same time, really galvanize this grassroots mobilization, the public support, which is more the bottom-up support, I feel we can really make a difference. But for so many years, these two sides have been disconnected. So as she changes climate, we're also trying to build bridges between the scientists, uh, all of you here building the knowledge, the people who are making the decisions, and also the people on the streets that are being mobilized. Okay, so the first thing um, is that uh, COP28 <clears throat> is probably going to be the largest COP ever, and also the most controversial COP ever. So I don't know, I'm guessing everybody knows what COP uh, is about. It's the conference of the parties to the Paris Agreement and to the Climate Convention. So this is the 28th meeting. The first COP happened in 1995, COP1. Uh, at the time, Angela Merkel was uh, Minister of Environment for Germany, and she was the one uh, chairing COP uh, as a president. Since the first COP, only five women have been appointed uh, as co-presidents. So you see there's also a gender issue there. And it's going to be a very important COP also because this is the first time that countries are taking stock of uh, the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So this is the first time, as you know, countries had to put on the table their nationally determined contribution, so their country plan at the national level. And the UNFCCC, the UN uh, Climate Secretariat, is also doing an aggregate analysis. When you add up all these pledges, all these country plans, all these NDCs, where are we heading? We know that if we add up all the NDCs that were submitted in Paris in 2015, we might get to 2.5 or even plus 3 degrees in temperature increase. So uh, we know that this is not enough. Also in the light of the latest science, uh, as we know that uh, climate change is actually accelerating because of some of the feedback loops we have in the system uh, with the forest fires emitting more carbon, also with the Arctic ice uh, melting and we have less of an albedo effect. The methane also um, emissions from uh, the melting of the uh, permafrost in Siberia. So we know already that this global stock take is going to tell everybody around the world that we're not doing enough, that there is a widening gap between what the policymakers are doing and what the science is telling us to do. But it's also a critical milestone to raise ambition as a wake-up call to accelerate action and to try to bridge that gap. I mean, we don't have any choice. We still need to act uh, we can't give up. I always tell myself, uh, we have to continue. I have to continue for my children, for the next generation. We can't give up. So even if the first stock take is going to be pretty dark, we still need to find the energy and the optimism to, to act, to try to bridge that gap. Everything we do today will uh, reduce the impact for tomorrow. It's also a world leaders meeting. So this is a, a place where ministers and heads of states are meeting. It is very difficult right now. We are in a fragmented world because of the war in Ukraine, uh, some of the impacts after COVID-19 that are still uh, impacting, for example, the price of food and very high prices on food and energy actually around the world. And this is what we call the poly crisis. So it's, it's a climate crisis, but it's also a crisis for nature, for biodiversity, and for people who are struggling around the world to pay for their energy bill, and for their food, uh, for food on the table. It's a UN negotiation. So as always, uh, the UN has to put together a very balanced package of decisions on the pillars of the four, uh, the four pillars of the Paris Agreement, which are mitigation. So how we reduce our emissions, finance, including loss and damage funds. Uh, this was the decision in Sharm el Sheikh the global adaptation goal and the means of implementations which are around capacity building and technology transfer. 
Okay, I may go a little bit faster because I'm sure that um, you maybe you know all of this. It's hard for me because I come from that space of climate diplomacy. I don't know how much you know. Um, so I'll try to maybe go a bit faster. But something that's important for, for you to know is uh, the priorities for COP28 are around these four systemic shifts that need to happen. So the first one is the energy transition. How can we really fast track the energy transition for all? Um, and that's also about uh, inclusion and diversity. How do we make sure that uh, everybody has access to clean energy? That means saving energy for the ones who consume more, but also scaling up access to renewable energy and other energy sources. Uh, finance, transforming climate finance. Uh, the countries from the north have promised that they would put $100 billion a year to help the poorest countries uh, deal with climate impacts and also leapfrog their development into a low carbon development. Uh, we are not there yet. <clears throat> We're only around 60 or $70 billion a year. And now most uh, countries from the south are saying that they actually need a lot more funding because the impacts and the, the disasters that are happening are costing a lot more than what we thought it would cost in 2015. So there will also be a discussion around a new finance goal uh, for the next few years. The loss and damage fund, I think, you know, it's an important one also for the developing countries. Uh, for now, there's no money in the loss and damage funds. They need to decide first the governance, who are going to be the people who decide on the funding priorities. And uh, one of our tasks as She Changes Climate is to make sure we have at least 50% of women on the board of the loss and damage fund. The reason why we are saying that is that uh, women and girls have 14 times more chance, um, 14 times more risk to die in natural disasters. So they are really the ones being impacted and they are also the ones who know where the solutions are and who know where the loss and damage funding has to go to be more resilient. So we feel they must be there in terms of the decision making, at least for 50% for of, the, of the board. Uh, finance as well, very important, is the reform of the uh, international financial institutions. This is what happened in uh, what started in June with the Bridgetown initiative that was started by Mia Motley. She's the prime minister um, of Barbados, very courageous woman. Emmanuel Macron also tried to, uh, to use that, of course, for his public image. But what is important there is uh, what is behind this initiative is actually really, really important. It's how you reform the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, because these large institutions are the ones that are providing a lot of funding to the poorest countries. Uh, but when these countries are being impacted by a climate disaster, they are still um, under the pressure of paying their debt. So there's a whole debate about debt cancellation as part of climate justice. Uh, we can't really ask uh, a small island that has been, uh, that has been impacted by a cyclone to continue paying a debt service and a huge interest rates to the World Bank and the IMF. So this is actually quite, also quite important. The third one is on nature. Putting nature at the heart of the climate agenda is very important. We know we can't reach the Paris Agreement. We can't reach the goal of the Paris Agreement without nature. About one third of the emissions are actually being uh, uh, absorbed by uh, the ocean, forest, ecosystems. So we must really protect forests, uh, the ability of the ocean to also absorb the carbon. We know there's a big problem there with ocean acidification, ecosystems, uh, soils as well. And, uh, and nature is also very important to help us adapt to climate change. Uh, when we have more species, more diverse ecosystems, we are more resilient also to, to face these impacts. And there's a whole debate on regenerative agriculture, how we continue producing food in a way that the soils are absorbing the carbon. And at the same time, that is really uh, resilient in terms of the climate impacts. There's also an important agenda there on the access to early warning. Uh, once again, uh, if you look at the floods in Pakistan, a lot of women and girls died because they didn't have access to the information. So they didn't know that a flood was coming and they didn't have access to a cell phone. 
uh, they were also sometimes staying behind to look after the babies or the elderly people. And so access to early warning is a top priority. It was a priority also of the UN Secretary General in New York uh, this month, because especially now that El Nino is so, is so impactful and that natural disasters are hitting people and livelihoods around the world, uh, we need to make sure people have access to these early warning systems. And last but not least, this is actually one of my favorite topics, uh, inclusion and diversity. Mobilizing all actors of society will really help us to make that transition faster. Uh, so women, youth, indigenous people, locally elected people. Uh, this is also this, um, the importance of making sure it's not always the same people deciding. Uh, we know that COP28, but also uh, other places of power and money are still dominated by the same type of people, I must say, very often uh, white men uh, from uh, rich countries, from the US, from Europe. And so we feel we really need to have, we really need to make space for a diversity of people to come in. Uh, we know that when women and young people are at the table uh, for COP decisions, but also on the board of companies and in the parliament, we have stronger decisions for the climate. So it's very important. It's not just an ethical question. It's actually a question of efficiency uh, to have a very strong decisions on climate and also very strong implementation. COP28 is, uh, as I said, um, is going to be very, uh, very important and at the same time, very controversial. Um, there will be a lot of pressure from civil society. So I have kind of mapped out the key actors. Uh, so, so civil society there is going to be uh, inside COP28, but also outside COP COP28, uh, making a lot of noise to phase out fossil fuels. The COP presidency, I think most of you, most of you know, uh, but we have a very uh, a very big challenge there with Sultan El Jaber, who is the COP president who is also the CEO of ADNOC. It's uh, one of the biggest oil companies in the, in the country of UAE and the fifth oil reserve. So we've been really pushing as she changes climate, but many groups around the world to say he must step down from the presidency role, or if he wants to stay as a co-president, he should step down from his CEO role uh, of ADNOC. He has not done that. Uh, but I can tell you when I was in Bonn uh, at the UNFCCC session in June, there was really, really a lot of pressure on him, including in the on the inside, uh, the youth groups and the women groups. When he arrived at the venue, they had some really big banners, phase out fossil fuels. So he, he is feeling the, the heat. And uh, our strategy as She Changes Climate is to actually try to support uh, these other women on the inside of the UAE who are not linked to the oil business and who are doing everything they can to restore environmental integrity and to restore the trust in the UNFCCC process. We feel it's very important because uh, the COP, the UN, is the only space still where countries can talk to each other about the climate crisis. And we don't think we can solve it by ourselves. I mean, even if Switzerland was doing better, Switzerland as a country is not enough. And so actually Switzerland has been playing an important role in the climate negotiations, sometimes trying to be um, a bridge builder and a, and a facilitator for these climate negotiations as part of the, uh, the group of countries that want more environmental integrity uh, together with Mexico and, and uh, South Korea and a few other countries. So uh, below Sultan El Jaber, there's this woman, Hana Alashini. I met her in person in Bonn, who is really dedicated to this agenda. And she will be the one uh, leading all the consultations with member states to restore the trust and to try to get some uh, meaningful outcome of this COP. So we want to support her. Nobody knows her. She's not uh, getting any credit in the media, any visibility. So we are doing everything to actually support her so that the spotlight is less on Sultan El Jaber and that she's getting more visibility, more power. Uh, Razan Al Mubarak is also important. She's the president of IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. She is quite visible already as a high level champion. She does a lot on nature, on nature based solutions, but she is not really the person who's going to do the uh, heavy political work. 
it's going to be Hana El Hashimi, at least for the party driven process. Um, the other important uh, one there is Shama El Mazrui. She's about, uh, I think she's 25 years old. She's the youth ambassador in the UAE. And something that's good to know for you is there's actually a lot of pressure inside the UAE as a country from youth to move out of fossil fuels. They want to diversify their economy. They're very worried about climate impacts because they are facing the impact there. I mean, they are now three or four months during the summer when people can't stay in Dubai or Abu Dhabi. It's too hot. And so they all have to get out of the country. So the youth mobilization inside UAE is also starting, putting pressure on the older generation. And so we, we have identified uh, key players on the inside that we want to support. And uh, obviously, we're going to keep the pressure on Sultan El Jaber in terms of the need to have a fossil fuel firewall between the COP delegation and the fossil fuel industry, because that was a big problem in Egypt last year. There were people from the fossil fuel industry who had a government delegation badge from Egypt who were getting into the negotiation room and sometimes even speaking on behalf of Egypt without the government of Egypt necessarily knowing that. So we've been talking to Sultan El Jaber and Hana El Hashimi in person to say, you know, you have to protect the process and really put a firewall uh, between the people speak on, speaking on behalf of the government and the people speaking on behalf of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, the two other important people there are Minister Chrissy. Barbara Chrissy is from South Africa. She's the Minister of Environment and Minister Jorgensen. He is the Minister of uh, International Cooperation from Denmark. So they are the co-facilitators of the global stock take exercise, which I mentioned at the very first, uh, in the very first slide. So this is for us a positive signal that there is now a willingness to have a model of shared leadership between the North and the South and between men and women. And we'd like that model to be um, followed for all the negotiations track to have always where well, North and South, they have started to do that now to have co-facilitators, but also a man and a woman for the gender balance because we are actually complementary in terms of our skills and uh, our level of empathy and, and the way we can also build a consensus. Okay, the other players, I think you know Antonio Guterres, he's the UN Secretary General. Simon Steele is the head of the UN Framework Convention of Climate Change. I'm not so impressed by Simon Steele so far. Antonio Guterres, I think you know him, very, very powerful voice on climate, also on gender equity, on youth, on the need to phase out fossil fuels. So he's clearly an ally for us. And all the other groups are the usual suspects. Uh, so we also need to remember that COP is not just run by the COP presidency. The COP presidency is there only to follow the UN protocol. The ones that are really going to make the decisions are the member states. Uh, so the biggest one, as you know, the EU, the United States, uh, China, G77, what we call the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Also, I must say, Russia is now kind of out of it. So now it's mainly Brazil, India, China, and South Africa. Uh, these are the main um, negotiating blocks as countries that are going to discuss uh, the decisions for COP28. So if there's no ambition from the EU or from China or from the US, uh, there's no way we can get a, a strong decision at the end of the process. So it's also very important for us to keep the pressure not only on the presidency, but also on the large emitters who are at the table. OK, so these are the key timelines. We're already in October. Uh, so something coming up soon is the IMF and World Bank meeting in Marrakesh on the 9th and 15th of October. Why it is important? Because they will talk again about the, um, finance, the finance pact on how we can uh, uh, looked at this uh, debt cancellation, where for now they're only talking about debt facilitation. But this is a start on how we can actually uh, review the, uh, the, the way these financial institutions are working so that the poorest countries have, can have access to finance for their uh, low carbon infrastructures and also for dealing with the impacts of climate change, for their resilience and sometimes for loss and damage for the ones that are most impacted. 
On the 21st of November, as she changes climate, we're going to convene an online summit. All of you are welcome to join. We do that now every year because COP has become so elitist. It's very hard to get a UN accreditation. It's very expensive to travel there. So we have this uh, online summit as an alternative COP in a way on the 21st of November, where everybody can join from around the world. And we put the spotlight on women leaders, uh, scientists, politicians, CEOs of companies that are already addressing the climate crisis uh, with climate solutions. The COP itself is from the 30th of November to the 12th of December. And at the very start, there will be the World Climate Action, Action Summit. These are the two days when uh, ministers and heads of states are coming. And then there are some thematic days on finance, energy, nature, and food. Uh, for us, we are going to, because we can't do everything, we're going to focus very much on finance and gender and on nature as well on the on the second week. We have a very limited team on the inside, only strategic people who can speak to government. And then obviously a, a lot of pressure from the outside, uh, from civil society groups, and so also from media and social media pressure uh, during that time. So the challenges for this year are very, <laughs> very big. <laughs> Uh, the first one is how do you build trust uh, in the process, how you safeguard environmental integrity. It's not just the UAE that is at stake. It's about the future of the United Nations and the future of uh, multilateralism. How do we respond to this climate crisis while at the same time uh, talking about the biodiversity crisis and uh, these uh, crises for people who are being who feel they are being left behind because the food of price is very high, the food of energy is very high, and they don't always have a say in this process. How do we bridge the carbon gap between uh, what the IPCC is asking us to do and what the policymakers have on the table in their NDCs? And then trying to restore a spirit of shared leadership and cooperation, which, which is really the spirit of the Paris Agreement and which is lacking right now at the international level while we are facing uh, these natural disasters and uh, growing debt levels also for the, the global south. So some of the opportunities, as I said, is uh, to identify the, the women and the people on the inside that can make a change. Uh, also, we want to give a voice to the women who are at the front line of climate impacts so this is something we did at the World Environment Day in Geneva in June. We connected the ambassadors, the diplomats with grassroots activists who were facing the impacts of climate change, uh, building a bridge between these two communities. We would like to host a multi-stakeholder event, a multi-stakeholder dialogue on, uh, on this poly crisis, uh, walking the talk on the 50-50 balance. And uh, with our network of partners, we have about 300 partners. We have 15 ambassadors in 15 countries. We, and with all of you now, also with She Changes Climate Switzerland, we are uh, trying to cultivate a very diverse and inclusive ecosystem of uh, leaders and important stakeholders from different sectors and geographies. And we feel this is also what will make us more resilient in, in terms of facing the climate crisis. Uh, one thing as well we're doing is providing a platform of mentoring for women leaders who want to work on climate change. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer system where we are connecting uh, climate leaders who have been in this space for 20 or 30 years with uh, young professionals who are getting into the climate space and don't know where to start and don't have the connection and the knowledge and sometimes also have a lot of eco-anxiety. Uh, so we have this peer-to-peer -peer system to support them with mentoring services, with professional advice, and also with tips and advice on uh, building the resilience, uh, you know, including uh, using mindfulness techniques uh, to also be able to um, deal with the, with the stress that it sometimes creates when you go into that field. So I think this is all for now. We also have a theme, but uh, I think uh, let's see if we have time for it. I would like to take a round of questions first. Um, and uh, really, um, our spirit is to work uh, with what we call radical collaboration. So working as one team for one planet. 
we want to go also beyond the egos and the logos and uh, because we feel the climate emergency is uh, is now and we can't wait so we have to also work in a way that we're trying to align and I must say I was really really pleased with the work of the um, uh, the Swiss Climate Alliance on Saturday because they are really the ones who have been bringing together all the stakeholders, all the NGOs, all the players uh, to have such a big mobilization on Saturday. And sometimes we, we should also give credit to these people who work as catalysts uh, in terms of bringing people together and in a spirit of um, aligning rather than uh, dividing. So over to you and thank you so much for this invitation today. Thank you very much, Elise.